Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. Rochelle Vanderzanian here with Corey Janoff. Hello. <laughs> Today, we wanted to talk about the concept of self-wealth and also the opposite of self-wealth, which is, you know, wearing on your sleeve that you have a whole bunch of money. <laughs> but basically, the idea with self-wealth is that you know, people can be very wealthy and you have no idea. There's a, are, there are a lot of wealthy people that just kind of fly under the radar. And there are some advantages to that. Absolutely. Just, you know, expectations that people have of you, expectations that you have of yourself, all of that kind of thing. So we're going to talk about a few examples of self-wealth. We're going to talk about how, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out that way <laughs> and talk about some of the highlights for how that can help you long term. Corey actually has a great story to get us started. So Corey, you take it away. Yeah, this is more or less what inspired us to record it, this topic this week. But uh, I, I'm going to alter some details just to keep things anonymous for innocent parties. But um, so I, I've got a friend who recently relocated to the Bay Area for work. And we all know the Bay Area is one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive areas in the country to live. Um, now, this individual is super successful financially. He's more or less financially independent. He could retire now if he wanted to and live comfortably. Uh, but he still wants to work because he's still in his 30s and he'd be bored otherwise. Um, so anyways, you know, he's relocated. And uh, he's renting a house there in a pretty nice neighborhood and because he's not sure he's going to be there long term rather than buying. He chose to rent, which we've talked about before on this podcast, buy versus rent. If uh, if you're not quite sure if you're going to be there long term, renting is probably the more financially prudent move. So good on him for making the smart decision there. And, um, you know, what, what I love about him is, you know, he's got plenty of money, but he still drives the same beat up car that he's had since college. And when I say beat up, that might be an understatement. Like it's got dents and paint scrapes and uh, it's very hideous, but, uh, but he loves it because he doesn't have to care about it at all. You know, he can park it on the street downtown or in a tight parking space and not worry about getting door dings or scrapes or cause he's, I mean, you can't make it any worse cosmetically at least. And the thing still runs fine gets them from point A to point B, no problems, very low maintenance. So it's great. Um, so anyways, he's, uh, it was parked in the driveway of this rental house that he's in. And the other day he received a note on his front door, an anonymous note from his neighbors. And I'll read it verbatim for you. I'll alter a couple things again for anonymity here, but it says, dear neighbor, hello. We were wondering if you can do us a favor. I don't mean to sound rude in any way, but it would be great if you could park your silver car in your garage. It's a bit of an eyesore for the neighborhood. I'm not sure you're aware, but homes in this development are valued between 2 million and 2.4 million. The homes on the hill are valued between 2.5 and 3.5 million. While the CCNRs do not prevent parking your vehicle in the driveway, it would be great if you could perhaps park your silver car in the garage out of sight and consider leaving your Tesla in the driveway. That would be more consistent with the neighborhood. Again, please do not be offended, and we don't mean to sound unwelcoming. It's actually rare to see that kind of vehicle in this town, let alone our development. Thank you for your cooperation. The neighbors. I'm trying really hard not to laugh out loud while you read that, by the way. <laughs> oh, how pretentious can you be? <laughs> oh, now, maybe that makes people sad. But yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I get where they're coming from. You know, let's try. Yeah, it's the value of your home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I understand it, but from a financial planning perspective, it's like the opposite of the mentality we want people to have. Here in this little community, the people are more concerned about status and appearing, you know, wealth, maintaining that appearance um, than they are about actually being wealthy. And the ironic thing is, like, my friend could pay cash for any of the houses on that street if he wanted to. 
Like he might have more money than his neighbors. But uh, but the joke is like, you know, again, they're they're more concerned about the appearances, um, you know, and it, it, I think that's it's a we're all guilty of it to some degree. Like I'm sure most of you mm-hmm. listening, like if there's a neighbor in your neighborhood who has a poorly kept house, you know, you know, the one who's, who doesn't water the lawn. Who, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. This is awkward for podcast recording. Uh, you know, the one who's got weeds growing in the front lawn and just doesn't take care of their yard and doesn't put the lawn chairs or the kids toys away. And, you know, everyone talks about them behind their back. You know, it, it, I, we get it. But at the same time, like, let's let's try and understand here. The person who has the beat up car, who doesn't drive the brand new car, they probably got more money in the bank than the people who are constantly spending money on new cars every few years. What or spending thinking? money on leases and they don't even own their vehicle. Bingo. But yeah, what were, aside from just laughing, Rochelle, what was your initial reaction to reading that? <laughs> I mean, it, it is hilarious. And I do understand, like, from a financial perspective, if someone in that neighborhood is trying to sell their home, like, that could maybe have an impact on how desirable that house right next door is or something like that. I certainly hope not. I certainly hope that, you know, the someone having a, an older car parked in the driveway is not going to detract from the value of your home, even in a really nice neighborhood. But who knows? Um, I also think that it, it's really just interesting how people approach issues like this nowadays. It's anonymous notes taped to your doorway, you know, like that is so indicative of society now, I feel like. But there's lots of smaller examples of things like this, too. And, and like you said, Corey, we, we all do it to a certain extent, whether it's assuming that maybe our neighbors should do things to take care of their homes better, or maybe even just within our own homes thinking we have to live up to a certain standard and we actually had this happen with us personally like our our refrigerator broke and it was a a stainless steel refrigerator and matched all of our other appliances and so we immediately had to go out and try to find a new refrigerator because how you function nowadays without a fridge Um, and just trying to replace it with low inventory issues with having like a, a smaller space than average it was going to be really hard and really expensive. And it was something where we ordered something that was going to be a few thousand dollars, which seems stupid, like $3,000 almost. And it was going to take three weeks to get here. And we were like, okay, we can, we can figure that out because obviously it needs to be matching. And, you know, like we were doing the same thing where it's like these appearance related things that don't really matter, but for some reason they do to us. And then it ended up getting pushed out another three weeks. And like, that was the deal breaker for us was we couldn't wait six weeks for a refrigerator and it ended up buying something that was supposed to be a, a temporary measure used. That was like $200 just to, to get us by. But once we had it and put it in the kitchen, it's like, well, this is perfectly functional. Why do we need, why do we need a stainless steel refrigerator that's significantly more expensive? And we ended up canceling the order that we did place, but at the same time, I know we're probably going to get that refrigerator at some point. Like, we're not going to, we're not going to just live with that white refrigerator for years. It's not going to last long. It's going to become the garage refrigerator at some point. But I don't know. There's, there's all sorts of small examples that you have in your life. Honestly, like the, the big things, like the car, probably in the house, all of that kind of stuff will have a big, bigger impact on you financially. But we do it all the time. Like whether it's small things or big things. Yeah, why do we care about what the refrigerator looks like when all we should really care about is if it keeps our food cold and is a consistent mm-hmm. temperature and actually works instead of going out on us. So, yeah, I think you know a lot of people fall into that trap of keeping up with the Joneses and buying status items they can't afford to impress people they don't care about because we're more concerned about how people what people think of us than what we think of ourselves, I suppose, or maybe we think it, maybe that impacts what we think of ourselves and we're just tricking ourselves. Um, And it's a recipe for financial struggles. If you're constantly trying to one up the neighbor or your friend or keep up with, you know, whoever you, you associate with in life, it's, you're going to be on the hamster wheel for longer than someone who's just content with what they have and doesn't care about what other people think of them or their outward appearance. 
Um, you know, it's it, it's a lot better to try and just live below your means, and and, and you know, it's harder to do, but uh, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it definitely can make things more comfortable. You have more flexibility and less stress and anxiety. You know, and let's be real, like your your true friends and family members, they don't really care how wealthy you are. They just like you for you. Um, you know, so what do we care about trying to impress other people with you know, those, those status items, the big house, the nice cars, the, the, the newest lawnmower or bicycle or, or you know, whatever, whatever we want to buy to, to show off and kind of exude wealth, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this whole idea of self wealth, it's um, probably better for you long term financially. It's just not something you can wear on your sleeve. You know, like no one posts the balance of their checking account <laughs> or, or, you know, like the balance of their 401k or, you know, your, your Roth IRAs, those kinds of things that are going to be so helpful for you long term to be able to, to live life the way that you want to and on your own terms. Um, and that, that's such a huge deal. It's just not something that people talk about very frequently. For sure. And wealth, you know, monetary wealth, that is, you know, true wealth is what you don't see. You know, it's, it's the balance sheet. It's the net worth. It's not the, the fancy watch or the clothes or designer jeans or the car. You know, most of that stuff is just going to depreciate in value. I'm sure that the big house, the nice cars are great, but if you have big loans attached to them all, it's all smoke and mirrors. You know, your net worth is what do you own minus what do you owe, what's left over, and, and you know, that's that's your wealth. Um, you know, again, purely financial wealth. But uh, you know, the less you spend on those status items, the more money you save for yourself talked about a few episodes ago how, how important your savings rate is how much you save as a percentage of your overall income is the biggest driving factor in your ability to achieve your financial goals so you know if we're, if we're saving a large percentage of our income great we can you know, more likely afford the lifestyle we want to live and retire sooner um, if we're spending our money on on you know the, the status items and saving a smaller percentage of it it's going to take significantly longer to ultimately achieve those financial goals. So, you know, in the stealth wealth concept, I think probably the best analogy that I like to look at it, you know, like take a look at Adam Sandler. You know, the dude wears basketball shorts and old t-shirts everywhere he goes. If you didn't recognize him from movies, if you ran into him on the street, you'd have no idea that he's worth probably four or five hundred million dollars. Just he doesn't look like a rich person. He looks like, you know, the the dude playing pickup ball at the YMCA. He's not, <laughs> he doesn't mm -hmm. give off a, a, a wealthy vibe, but that's, that's the whole point of stealth wealth is you, know, you fly under the radar and you know, keep it low profile and, and the money stacks in the bank account, not, you know, outwardly available to see on your car. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, you know, you have, lower expectations of you in like the circles that you run in like people aren't necessarily expecting you to pick up the tab everywhere you go and maybe you want to but that doesn't you maybe you don't have to maybe there's less of an expectation there you know if you donate to charity you can kind of do that on your terms instead of people coming to you and expecting you to give all the time um i think one example that i hadn't really thought of in the past is just like the cost that you pay to maintain your home is partially a function of where you live. Like if you live in a really nice neighborhood and you own a really nice home, the contractors that you associate with to do work on that home are going to assume you have money to spend and they're probably going to charge you more. And, it, you know, if you live in a more modest neighborhood, they're going to assume that you don't have very much money, even if you do have a lot in the bank. They don't get to see your, your bank account statements or anything like that. So, you know, you can potentially pay more reasonably priced costs on things like that. And that's, that's really valuable, especially if you do want to put in some work on a home. Well, and and going they, back yeah. to the initial example with, you know, the, the, the nice neighborhood keeping a, an appropriately valued or priced car on the street rather than a beat up one, like um, the, the upkeep and the maintenance isn't going to be as demanding. 
know, you, you, you don't have to, if there's, you know, you know, some, if the paint starts to fade on, on the, on the siding, like whatever, you know, the other houses are all mm -hmm. faded too. You know, whereas if every house gets repainted every four years around you, you're going to feel the need to get your house repainted every four years to, to keep it up and keep that appearance. So there's mm -hmm. definitely, um, you know, we want to keep up or keep down with the Joneses. We want to fit in with the people around us. And if, if nobody is, is, is buying fancy cars in our neighborhood, we're going to look like the weirdos who drive the fancy cars if we're the only ones with them. Or if, you know, if we're constantly doing home renos, you know, people are going to be like, who are those guys? They're just, they're, 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 mm -hmm. they're constantly like upgrading their home. Why aren't they happy with what they got? Like the rest of us. So yeah. like you, you don't want to I think a lot of though. times it's better for people's mental health too. And they can, you know, kind of rein in the spending because if you are spending less then you're saving more. Um, and that gives you so much flexibility. It gives you flexibility in the amount of work that you do and the jobs that you take and how long you have to work, all of those kinds of things, which are, are huge. You know, if we're not forced into taking the job that pays the most, even if it doesn't have a great work-life balance, then obviously that's going to be good for us even in the short term. And then obviously the, the long-term consequences of that just compound. You know, if you can save more, that is dramatically better. Um, so there's, and I love the idea of that, you know, like, like financial independence or, you know, building wealth that people can't see. I, I feel like the goal should be <laughs> like some, some better mental health and, and just having the flexibility to live life the way that you want to. For sure. Avoid the rat race, have lower expectations, less pressure. You can, you know, you don't have to keep the, the pedal to the metal and feel like you have to grind just to maintain that, that lifestyle and that appearance. So um, kind of all gets back to the whole idea of financial independence, what everyone's ultimately striving for in one shape or another. You know, some people want to achieve it sooner. Some people are content working longer and it, it means different things to different people. But at the end of the day, it's, it, it's simply just, are you able to live life on your own terms and, and, Kind of if you choose to stop working, you can afford the lifestyle that you've grown accustomed to. It's a lot easier to get to that point if you have if the lifestyle that you live is is uh, is a little bit more modest and you, you've got mm -hmm. a wealthier um, or I guess you're you know you're you got more net worth than you give off, if you will. You know you're wealthier than other people may may guess if there was a you know one of those guessing games like those things that you see sometimes at carnivals or it's a jar full of M&Ms or marbles or something and you got to guess the number that's in there and whoever guesses right is mm -hmm. the winner. It's like, you know, it's kind of like that except, you know, maybe you've got like giant gumballs on the outside and then you can't see them but a bunch of tiny little ones on the inside. So really there's a thousand mm -hmm. in the jar when it only looks like there's a couple hundred. So that's what we want the stealth wealth to be like. You got a, a ton of ton of wealth behind the scenes that no one can really see. So that'll help you achieve financial independence a lot sooner. So and, and do I that, don't think just, this is, yeah, ahead, it's not like a one size fits all formula either. Like it, it totally depends on, on the individual and, and what their goals and priorities are and their level of income too. You know, like if you're a surgeon and making dramatically more money than, than someone else who might be listening to this, it's, it's different, like you just, you have to live within your means, but at the same time, you probably have a lot more flexibility. Um, but most people that listen to this podcast, you have significantly more income than the average American, you know, or even if you're in training, you make what the average American does, <laughs> you know, like maybe even a little bit more. So it's all a matter of, of putting things in perspective to a certain extent, too. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I think kind of to sum things up a little bit, you know, we want to want avoid the rat race, you know, avoid the status symbols, keeping up with the Joneses, really assess needs versus wants, the difference between things you need and things you want. We 
We need a refrigerator that keeps the food cold. We <laughs> want a stainless steel one that looks cool and has LED lights. And has like a, an ice maker. That would be really nice. That's yeah, definitely something go. I miss. Instead of the trays <laughs> that you have to fill in and yeah. spill and stuff, and you crack them and it gets the little ice chips mm -hmm. all over. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we need a car that gets us from point A to point B reliably. We, we might want a nice car with heated seats and heated steering wheels and, you know, all the, the fancy Backup technology. cameras. And... Yeah, but, you know, we, we, we just need something that, that drives. And, uh, yeah, you could just go down the list of everything in life, the, the need versus want list. You know, at the end of the day, it's if you got food, water, and shelter, your needs are met. And if you got people around you that love you and care about you, you're set. Anything beyond that is a luxury item, arguably. And uh, so let's, you know, take an assessment of, of what's really important and, you know, keep keep more of our wealth in our own pockets rather than shelling it out to other people for those those status items and just be more content with what we have. Oh, we're so preachy, Corey. I love it. Anything else to add? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you guys are good. Whatever you're doing, you're you're trying, which is great, honestly. Like I think if you're listening to financial planning podcast, your your head's in the right space. So don't don't go too crazy. You're you're doing okay. Thank you everyone for listening. And if you have an issue with something your neighbor is doing, talk to them in person rather than leaving an anonymous <laughs> note on their door. And if you can't talk to them in person, maybe it's something you shouldn't be saying. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, have a good one. We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP, Instagram at Corey Janoff, or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanden Rochelle, or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanden. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at theaffinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Affinity Group, LLC.